Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Uh, in case you first time you've ever joined our program, every week we uh, have this opportunity to come to you in your living room uh, to present men and women who, in their love for our Lord Jesus Christ, are drawn home to the church. And uh, we've been doing this a few years. This is, we're in our 18th year. And uh, one, of the, one of the beauties is many of the old programs are all available online or uh, go to EWTN at their website and you can connect to all the old Journey Home programs and hear the stories of men and women who've made this journey. And our guest tonight, Michael Lofton, is a former Baptist and Presbyterian. So, Michael, it's wonderful to have you join Thank us you. on the journey home. My honor to be here. And to come and tell your story. Yeah. And what I'd like to do is to get out of the way as soon as I can and invite you to go way back and sure. uh, give us a, a thumbnail of your journey. Absolutely. Well, I was born here in the United States, 1984, uh, born into a Christian household. Um, but at the age of two, my family and I moved to Israel. Whoa. Uh, yeah. And in fact, we lived in Jerusalem, about 10 minutes walking distance from where the Temple Mount once Is that it. right? Wow. Yes. Wow. So we were right there in the heart of the Holy Land. Now, just what was your back, your religious background there? Brought up? Uh, Christian at that time. Just uh, general. Just Christian. born into a Christian has household. It was a Protestant, non-denominational, gotcha. uh, somewhat charismatic okay. uh, background. But of course, I was too young to really understand okay. any right. of that. Uh, but we moved to Israel at the age of two. Uh, and my father worked at the Christian embassy there, um, evangelizing Jews and Arabs and things like that. Really? Well, mm -hmm. so exactly. Yeah, doing bringing that. them to the Lord. So at the age of four, unfortunately, my parents divorced. And so we moved back to the United States. States, and I began to live with my mother at that time. And my mother, I would say within a few years, uh, converted to Judaism. Really? Uh -huh. Had that and started when you were over there before? No, it, I think it was after. It and okay. so she converted to Judaism, she met a Jewish man, she married him, and they decided um, for my sister and I to move back to Israel. Uh, because my mom wanted to raise us in the Holy Land practicing Judaism. Huh. So I moved back to Israel at the age of seven. And I loosely practiced Judaism. Of course, I didn't know what I was doing. It was pretty much just a nominal thing. My mom would tell me, okay, today's the Sabbath. Now you have to lead the prayers because I was the man of the house at seven years old. So <laughs> I, would, uh, I would do some of the prayers, but of course I didn't really understand it. Um, so we loosely practiced Judaism for a few years. Um, but at, at the age of 12, there was some stuff going on to where we needed to return to the, to, to the United States. Um, so at that time, we came back to America again, and I began to live with my father at that time. I was yeah. kind of tired of moving around. I wanted to uh, move in with my father. So I moved in with him in Louisiana at the age of 12. And he was going to a charismatic uh, Christian community and going to some services there. And I began to go uh, to church with him. And I was pretty soon converted to Christianity. I was baptized in the Trinitarian form on December 31st of 1996. So okay. I entered into uh, God's mystical body, although in, impartially at that time. Yeah. And, you wouldn't have uh, used that language. No, right? no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Looking back on it, I understand that now. But yeah, that was the, the moment that I was engrafted into Christ. And uh, I did have a, a somewhat of a change in my life. I was somewhat interested in the things of God at that time and started reading scripture a little um, and tried to live the faith somewhat. But of course, as I got into my teens, like so many others, I pretty much abandoned the faith. I still nominally identified myself as a Christian, uh, non-denominational, non but um, not in practice. In practice, I was living a pretty sinful lifestyle like a lot of teenagers, unfortunately, do. And, you know, I'll tell you, Mike, I'm trying to imagine at that young age, there you are, what, 12, 13, yeah. 14? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've been a lot of places oh, already. Oh, yeah. yeah. And a lot of different religious traditions already, mm -hmm. and so that's going to cause some... Uh, shakiness in the foundation for you to take seriously yeah. what you had just adopted when you came back to your father. Indeed, indeed. And and so I didn't take it very seriously. Maybe for a year or two, I guess I did. But like I said, once I got into teenage life, I 
began to live a pretty profligate lifestyle. Um, by the age of 19, I wanted to move to New York. My mother was living in New York City at the time. I wanted to get my share of the big city life, <laughs> sow my wild oats. <laughs> and so I called her up and said, hey, I want to move to New York. It was Staten Island. Um, moved to Staten Island, um, packed my stuff, drove all the way over there, got there about 24 or 28 hours. <laughs> so I was ready to get there and lived an even worse lifestyle. Um, <laughs> In New York City, eh? you know, without getting into all the details it involved with, you know, just really bad things, fornication, um, alcohol, things like that, just living a terrible lifestyle. And um, I got to the point. Uh, I, was there any conscience going on during that time? Or you think you'd just been darkened? No, no, my my conscience was shot at that point. I, I can recall there were times uh, looking back at it now. Yeah. I can recall there were probably a f few years there I didn't even think of the concept of God. I was that depraved. Mm -hmm. I was that far gone that just the very concept of deity, of God, didn't even cross my mind. I was mm -hmm. that far gone. Mm -hmm. I was living a very, very horrible lifestyle. And I had some really terrible things go on at that time that brought me to the point that I really didn't want to live anymore. Mm. And I, this was at the age of 22, living in New York. I, I seriously did not want to live anymore. I was very suicidal. The only reason why I did not commit suicide is because I believed that if I would commit suicide, I would go immediately to hell. Um, uh, so you at least had that little bit in your conscience, at least, at least a little. I, I had something to guard me against that, but I was between a rock and a hard place. I, I didn't want to live anymore. At the same time, I, I couldn't take my own life because I knew that hell would be worse than anything I've ever experienced here on earth. And so I just couldn't do it. So I remember praying to God at that time. I turned to Him in prayer, believe it or not, and I, and I said, I'm 22 years old. I'm not going to do another 22 years. I'm not going to do this. Something needs to happen. And in God's providence, um, He brought some people to me. They were um, non-denominational, maybe somewhat charismatic Christians. And they invited me to a preaching event. Well, I went to the preaching event, and there was a guy there. Um, I won't say his name, but he, he was a man who was converted to Christianity in prison. My understanding is this man had murdered several people, went to prison for a long time and was converted in prison. When he was released, he began a street ministry. And he was there at the event. And um, he gave me a, a nice hardback study Bible to follow along with the preaching. <laughs> and I thought he was just gonna let me borrow it. But at the end, I go to hand it to him. He said, no, no, you keep it. And I was so impressed by the fact that somebody would give me this really nice, it was an NIV study Bible, I didn't know what it was, yep. but it was a really nice hardback uh, Bible, and I, I just was so impressed by the fact that somebody cared enough about me to give me something like this, especially a Bible, that somebody cared about me to give me the Scriptures. Um, so, you know what? I said, I'm going to read this thing. I went home and I read it cover to cover in a little over 30 days. And mind you, I was not an avid reader. I, I, at that time, my philosophy was, why read when you have television? <laughs> so I w it was not an avid reader, but for some reason, I knew that I needed to read Scripture. So I would just pour and labor over Scripture every day, maybe about six hours a day. I would, I would still go to work, have a full-time job, but in my spare time, probably about six hours a day, reading Scripture till my eyes were too blurry to read anymore. Go to sleep wake up and do it again. Read it cover to cover, and yes, I did make it through Leviticus, by the way. And people <laughs> some, people always wonder, did you really make it through Leviticus? I did. I did make it yeah. through Leviticus. Even, even Ezekiel gets a little rough at <laughs> times. It does. It's from 40 to 48. Yeah, it gets pretty burdensome. But uh, in fact, those are now some of my favorite chapters because I see a lot of typology in them. But anyways, um, yeah, I, I made it through the Scriptures, and I'll tell you, it profoundly changed my life. Mm. It was a Saul to Paul kind of conversion. Um, it, it God, in a, in a way of speaking, knocked me off my horse, took the scales from my eyes, profoundly changed me. And it shocked everyone who knew me because I was such a hardened sinner. And here is this man now on fire for Christ. 
and, and you know, so I was constantly reading scripture, constantly getting into theology and learning everything that I can about God and praying and, and now starting to go to church and things like that. It just profoundly changed me. And, and from that moment on, I have not been the same. I think that's when I really began to experience the grace of my baptism that I received at the age of 12. <laughs> Excuse me. That's, that's when I really um, began to unfold that grace that I received at 12. Mm -hmm. I began to cooperate with it and saw the fruits of it. Um, so I moved back to Louisiana. I wanted to be near my father. Um, and I also wanted to go to college, finish college, um, because it's a lot cheaper tuition-wise <laughs> in Louisiana <laughs> than New York. So I said, let, let me just go back to Louisiana. I came back to Louisiana and um, began to go to a Baptist church, um, because my father was going to a Baptist church at the time. Was, I, he, was he happy uh, to hear about your change Oh, of are you kidding me? He was <laughs> thrilled. He was thrilled. And uh, I mean, it was a profound shock, uh, I mean, impact on him, uh, because he knew how I was. Yeah. So yeah, he was very, very happy. So I began to go to church with him. And I, I had a daughter uh, that was due, and it was along the way. So I had to start considering the issue of pedo-baptism, which is, you know, just a fancy word for infant baptism, baptizing your infants. And uh, I had to start considering that issue. Of course, Baptists don't practice that. Right. Um, but so I started to look at scripture on that issue. I started to read uh, the early church fathers on pedo baptism to see if there's any merit to this. Because, hey, if I need to baptize my daughter, I want to do this. I don't want to be negligent in my duties to my children. So I began to consider the issue and I became convinced of pedo baptism. So by the time my daughter was born, I had um, converted to Presbyterianism. Uh, so I became Reformed and. Um, had my daughter baptized. And of course, in the Reformed community, they often emphasize church history. I mean, some Baptists may emphasize church history, some Protestants do, but the Reformed more so. Um, so I started to study church history. And you know, one of the struggles with all those groups, and God, God bless our baptized brothers and sisters, um, is how do you deal with history given their own spin on tradition and, and scripture and uh, the Baptists, you know, have their own trail of blood view of history. You know that, of yes. course, and the Presbyterians yes. feel a little more comfortable with a lot of history. They're a little just, more comfortable. Just yeah. to mention that to our radio listeners, our guest is Michael Lofton, former Baptist and Presbyterian. So you jump in the Presbyterian. I made, I made the same switch I yeah. did after seminary went Presbyterian because I felt at least here's a group that's got uh, the collection of the wisest of the wives mm -hmm. throughout history mm -hmm. with their creeds and the, and the book of order. Yeah, right. yeah, and they had some sense of uh, historicity to their faith. Right. This wasn't, uh, for them, in their eyes, was it something that was made up overnight. For them, they thought they were in continuity with the early church. Well, I decided to test that hypothesis <laughs> because the Protestant narrative is essentially that, uh, at least according to the Reformed, is that the earlier Christians were essentially you know, Protestant, essentially in doctrine, um, but the Catholics came along generally in the Middle Ages and corrupted the faith, and uh, the reformers, the magisterial reformers like Calvin and Luther and Zwingli had to uh, pretty much restore the church to the way it was in the early days of Christianity. So I decided, let, let's test that hypothesis. Let, let's see if that's true. And so I began to study church history. From a Protestant perspective, I began to read Protestant historians like J.N.D. Kelly, uh, Philip Schaff, Henry Chadwick, yep. Bruce Shelley, uh, Everett Ferguson. I mean, I can go on and on. I began to read all of these guys, um, all of their church history books. And then I started to see these guys don't really seem Protestant, not the writers, but the early church Christians, they didn't really seem Protestant in their doctrine. I mean, you have J.M.D. Kelly talking about the earlier Christians had a larger canon than Protestants do today and believed in the Eucharist and things like that. So I said, all right, well, let me actually turn to the church fathers themselves. So I began to read the church fathers themselves. I started studying the apostolic fathers, which are those church fathers that uh, pretty much span from the time of the apostles or right after their death until uh, roughly, I don't know, late second century, early third century, right around there. I read all of the apostolic fathers. 
everything that they had except for one exception because uh, there was a, a, a book by Irenaeus that was just released. So <laughs> I had not read that one. But anyways, I read all of the Apostolic Fathers, began to read uh, the Nicene and post-Nicene Fathers, which those are pretty much from the second century to 750 AD. Began to read all those guys, St. John Chrysostom, Augustine, uh, St. Bede, John Damascene, you name them. And I thought, these guys were not Protestant. I mean, <laughs> you have some of these apostolic fathers in the early second century talking about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, saying that the Gnostics would abstain from re eating the body and blood of Christ. They would abstain from the Eucharist because they, of course, didn't believe Jesus had a body. So they refused to eat his body and blood. And he's speaking in reference to the Eucharist. I'm thinking, wow, this is a guy who sat at the feet of the apostles. This is at the turn of the second century. And here he is talking about Catholic doctrine, essentially transubstantiation. Kind of shocked me. And so I began to see things like that and the Marian doctrines that you have in St. Justin Martyr and St. Irenaeus and uh, the papacy, which you see with St. Clement of Rome, probably written, written 80 A.D. While the Apostle John is still alive, you have the Bishop of Rome, Pope St. Clement, Clement I, writing to the Corinthians, telling them to straighten up, follow your bishop, and if you don't listen to me, this is going to be a serious sin. Who is this guy to tell them what to do <laughs> all the way from the West telling these, these Eastern Christians what to do? He assumed that he had the authority to do that. He didn't even argue for the papacy. He assumed it. And we know that the Corinthians received his letter. They've read it uh, and were reading it 100 years after it was written, still reading it in their churches. So clearly you see the papacy there uh, with Pope Pope St. Clement I. So I'm seeing all this, and it's just not adding up, <laughs> you know. And then I begin asking questions like, uh, okay, well, you know, with with Protestants, essentially Scripture is the highest authority. Some say it's the only authority. Some will say it's the highest authority. That's generally the Presbyterian view: is that Scripture is the highest, and maybe they'll consider tradition. It's not authoritative, but it may be helpful. Well. I, I said, okay, well, how do we know which books belong in the Bible? Because if this is our ultimate authority, how did we get this Bible? How do we know which books belong in it? Because there are some Christians saying these books belong in it. Some saying these books don't belong in it. Luther debating the canon with Calvin and some of the early Christians debating these issues. How do we know, you know which books belong in the Bible? So I started a asking questions like that and started studying the issue of the canon throughout, um, throughout history and realized that uh, the Protestant narrative isn't really adding up. Yeah, I mean, if the, if the Bible is the primary foundation for your faith, whether it's the soul or the primary foundation, we're talking about changed lives. Do this, don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes making great demands on our lives, on what we believe. So you got to know whether this particular book in this thing is authoritative yes. or can I just yes. ignore it? Yes. Uh, and that becomes the issue. Luther wanted to take James and I don't like James to take that out of there. Uh, well, can you do that? Exactly. Of course, the yeah. book of Revelation says you don't be adding or taking away from this collection, yeah. from that book. Yeah. Does that apply to the whole yeah. selection? I mean, those yeah. are the questions that arise. That was, those are great questions and those are questions that need to be answered, and, and I frankly could not find the answer uh, from the Protestant view. At the same time, I began asking questions like, who determines what is orthodoxy and what is heresy? Because I'm reading these church fathers, and they're fighting all these heretics like Arius and people like that. Well, how do you know who's a heretic? How do you know who is orthodox? Don't tell me the Bible. Well, don't tell me the Bible alone, because the problem there is, which books belong in the Bible? And then, Whose interpretation is authoritative? Because I've seen some great exegetes hash out Scripture. Exegetes are those people who interpret Scripture. I've seen some of those scholars hash out very important issues from opposing sides. How do you know which one is right? There has to be some kind of ultimate authority that Christ gave to us to determine which interpretation is accurate, especially if this is the Word of God. He would have given that to us. So I was starting to see a lot of holes in the Reformed uh, community. Were and you finding I, any help from your local clergy? Or? I was asking professors, um, 
uh, very well-known professors about these questions, uh, my pastor, and, and they just weren't giving me sufficient answers. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I began to seek answers elsewhere. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so I, I'm studying the Church Fathers. I'm seeing things aren't adding up. Yeah, were, were, you, were you thinking about the Catholic Church at all during all these years? No, because I wanted to be a pastor or a priest. That was what I was investing my life into. And I knew in the Latin rite, it's very extraordinary to be a married right. man and to be uh, a priest. So, I, And since I didn't have any Eastern Catholic churches around me, I knew that, okay, I, I'd have to give this up. Um, and I just wasn't you know, ready to do that unless I knew that this is yeah. the truth. I, I wasn't ready to do it. So I started studying Anglicanism and Orthodoxy because I was looking for something that had apostolic succession. Now, granted, Anglicans technically don't have uh, apostolic succession, but I did not know that, that at the time. Right. Uh, I thought that they did. And basically apostolic su succession is essentially the doctrine that uh, your bishops go all the way back in their ordinations to the apostles themselves. The apostles ordained men who laid their hands, who ordained other men, who laid their hands on other men, who laid yeah. their all the way to present day bishops. Um, and, and in fact, this was apostolic succession was something that I was seeing in the early church fathers. You have Irenaeus fighting the heretics saying, uh, you know, these guys are teaching all these heresies. Well, who ordained them? <laughs> Trace your, your ordination all the way back to the apostles. You can't do it. They were using apostolic succession to show that these men were heretics. Yeah. So um, I, I knew that I needed to be in a, in a church that had continuity with the apostles, that it had some kind of pedigree going back to them. So I began to consider Anglicanism, uh, but I started seeing a lot of the different Anglican views. And it again brought me to the point, how do you know which one is Orthodox? Which group is in heresy? Which group is uh, right? So I couldn't find the answer there either. Started considering the Eastern Orthodox communions uh, in churches. And um, I was asking the same questions there. Although they have valid apostolic succession, you do have some differing views among the Orthodox on some port, important issues like divorce and remarriage, contraception, and so on. Yeah. You have different views, so how do you know which one of these are right? Well, their answer is, that, well, an ecumenical council can determine those things, but then the question is, who determines which council is an, an ecumenical council and which is a robber council, which is a false council, <laughs> which is a council that teaches heresy, and which is a council that is teaching the truth? Apart from the Bishop of Rome, you can't answer that question. Mm -hmm. The only way you can know what an ecumenical council is, is the Bishop of Rome is the one who authorizes it and says, yes, that is an ecumenical council. Other than that, you can't know what an ecumenical council is, which is why they haven't had one since the schism. They have to have the Bishop of Rome for it. So I couldn't find the answer with Eastern Orthodoxy. So I consider Catholicism. <laughs> and, and you gotta understand, I was very anti-Catholic. Um, I, I really believed that the Catholic Church was what the book of Revelation calls the harlot of Babylon. Uh, I believed that this was the church of Antichrist. So you got to understand, I had a lot of issues to work through <laughs> to even consider Catholicism. Um, but I, I did. I started considering it because I, I, I want to find the truth. I want to find the answer to these questions. Let me see what Catholicism has to offer. And so I began listening to people like Scott Hahn. Uh, I watched some Journey Home episodes, believe it or not. <laughs> began to read Catholic authors and um, watched Catholic or listened to Catholic Answers live and, and to the apologists there and read some material that they had to offer and um, just trying to get answers to all the questions that I have. And I realized they have the answer. How do you know what is heresy? How do you know what is orthodoxy? Well, the magisterium of the Catholic Church determines those things. The bishops who are in communion with the Holy Father, those are the one, ones who determine what is orthodoxy on matters of faith and morals. Hmm. So there's the answer to one of my questions. How do you know which books belong in the canon? Again, uh, the magisterium determines that, and that was in continuity with what I was learning uh, from the early church. You had local councils determining those things, and then you have ecumenical councils, uh, like I believe it was the Fourth Lateran Council and also uh, the Council of Trent 
definitively determining the canon. So you have the magisterium of the Catholic Church deciding the canon. And so there's another answer to my question. Um, you know, when you take that one issue uh, about a, a, a gathered group of Christian leaders deciding the canon, apart from the hierarchy and union with the Pope declaring this canon, if you take that away, then, hey, you and I, might can sit down and decide we're coming up with our own yeah. canon. Why not? Yeah. You know, Jesus said, whenever two or more gathered my name, yeah. there am I in the midst of you. So why this canon? And of course, we do know that there are some Christian groups like the Mormons that have their book, the yeah. Book of Mormon, yeah. or, or the yeah. Seventh-day Adventists. They've got Ellen G. White's books that they raise up at, at a level of a scripture. So, you know, why not? Yeah. If Unless you have the magisterium in union with the Pope. In union with the Pope is the key because uh, the Orthodox have bishops. But the problem is some of those bishops differ with each other on the canon. Believe it or not, the Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox, they have various canons. They don't have the same yeah. Bible, not all of them. And so how do you know which group of bishops among the Orthodox is right? Well, you can only know based upon the bishops that are in communion with the Holy Father. And that was making sense from what I was seeing in the early church. They were basically saying in the early church where Peter is, that's the successor of Peter, the Pope, where Peter is, there's the church. And yeah. St. Jerome and all these other church fathers talking about the importance of being in union with the Holy Father, with the Bishop of Rome. Uh, so I realized, okay, there, there's something to Catholicism here. Well, I think the definitive thing for me was I was listening to these lectures by Scott Hahn on the papacy. And he was explaining how Matthew 16 through 18, which was a passage I had studied many times as a Protestant, but he was showing how that passage is to be understood in light of Isaiah 22. Mm -hmm. Basically, in Isaiah 22, you have uh, the steward of the king. And the steward had authority over Israel in the king's absence, in the king of Israel's absence. He was pretty much the king the the king on behalf of the king um, had all of his authority in his, in his absence. And he was saying the language that is used in Isaiah 22 is the same language that you find in Matthew 16, 18 through 19. So when you have Jesus uh, telling Peter that upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it and you know whatever you loose will be loosed in heaven, whatever you bind will be bound in heaven and saying all that. He is point, hearkening back to Isaiah 22. In other words, Peter and his successors are the stewards in Christ's bodily absence. He is the one who determines definitively, okay, this is heresy, this is orthodoxy. He's the one that you listen to. He's Christ's mouthpiece, if you will, when he speaks uh, yeah. definitively on matters of faith and morals. I'm not saying everything that he says is infallible. Right. Of course not. But everything that he says on matters of faith and morals, when he defines it to be held universally by the church, it's infallible. It's guaranteed by Christ. So that just answered all of my questions and I realized I needed to become Catholic. Well, and, and even in that one issue, what we're trusting is Christ's promise of the Holy Spirit that will guide his apostles yes. into all truth. Yes. And we see that when he breathes on them in John 20, also in Acts 2, when we see the, the fulfillment on Peter preaching the first Christian sermon. Uh, we, that's what we trust. Not just the person, you know, good Pope Francis, you mm -hmm. know, it's not just that, it's because yeah. we believe the Holy Spirit yeah. is guiding him. Let's, let's pause there, Mike. Sure. It's time for a break. We'll come back and pick up, because now you're saying, I'm ready to become Catholic. Well, that, that is not an easy step. <laughs> no. So we'll come back to that after the break. See you then. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host, and our guest is Michael Lofton. And we've paused you. <laughs> you know, we push the pause button there on, on, on your journey. Yeah. Because, uh, as you said, uh, following the lead of, of, our, of our good friend Scott Hahn, 
uh, seeing that our Lord was seeing the image of Isaiah 22 in, as the assistant to the king, mm -hmm. he was a representative of the king. But still, look, so you're ready to become Catholic. I'm saying, no, wait a second, wait a second here. I mean, I mean, it, it's still hard to, uh, when you've been a, a Christian of a variety of ilks all your life, to accept the authority. Mm -hmm. y you know, that's yes. where you're at. Yes, uh, it, it's a hard thing because as a Protestant, you're you're the ultimate authority. Now, I know there's going to be a lot of Protestants who are offended by that. They say, no, God is the ultimate authority, and sacred scripture is true, but who's interpreting that? You're saying that yourself is the ultimate authority because you're saying, I have the, and I'm the one who determines uh, what is right um, based upon what I'm reading in scripture. I'm the one who interprets it. So often the, the, the phrase is, but, but the scriptures say, Right. According to who? The scriptures say, and, and the people that say that yeah. Yeah. don't realize to what extent what they're really communicating yeah. is their opinion of that scripture yeah. or their, their traditions spin on that scripture without taking time to realize yeah. that the church next door has a different spin exactly. on it. And they're both saying scripture says, but it's saying two different things. And I was aware of this church next door saying something completely different uh, because I had studied the various groups among uh, Protestants and I was realizing, okay, some of these people have different views on justification, on baptism. I mean, does this regenerate or not? Is it essential or not? Um, there's all kinds of views out there on important things. These aren't just adiaphora, which is uh, matters that don't really matter to one's salvation. These are matters that es are essential for salvation. I mean, justification is huge. So you have some Protestants saying, well, you know, the Protestant reformers are wrong on justification, and the Catholics kind of were right. Uh, granted, those are few and far in between. Most of them will say that the Catholics are wrong on it. But again, you have some really good exegetes differing on these essential issues. How do I know whose interpretation is, is authoritative? You know, something else that struck me, uh, given your background, y y you had kind of a good time in New York. <laughs> All right. Whether good is maybe not the best word to put next to it, but you had a free time in New York. I have known close associates who, even though they have a conversion to Christ and a life-changing experience in the traditions that you mentioned, Baptist, Calvinist, which emphasize a once saved, always saved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, Christ died for my sins in the past, present, and future. Yeah. That they end up struggling with, well, what about the moral life? Does it make a difference? Yeah, that was a huge thing for me because, of course, I came from the, um, especially as a Baptist, but then uh, as a Presbyterian, they have uh, in, in what's called Calvinism, they have the perseverance of the saints, which isn't exactly once saved, always saved, but it's kind of the same concept. Granted, there is a difference. Uh, but essentially it's saying if you're truly just uh, justified, if you're truly one of the elect, you're not going to fall away. And so, you know, still wrestling with some moral issues at that time. I'm asking the question, you know, have I fallen away from God's grace? Have I uh, turned my back on him? And there are scriptures that say that I can explicitly do this that I just can't explain away. Uh, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 6. I mean, there was just everywhere you turn, there's scripture saying that you can reject the grace of God. I mean, the book of Galatians, that's what it's about. He's telling them not to reject the grace that they've been given in baptism. And so how do I know if I've done that? Well, it was the Catholic understanding of mortal sin that was very helpful for me. Mm. The distinguish between mortal sin and venial sin. Um, and it also explained, based upon scripture and tradition, how in fact you can lose your salvation. and um, Or you can reject your salvation, I should say. It's not something that you just lose, <laughs> something that you are turning your back on. And it was also consistent with what I was reading in the early church fathers who were very adamant on that issue. I don't know any of them who taught the once saved, always saved kind of view. I, even Augustine, who had a very strong view of the perseverance of the saints, talked about you have the ability to fall into mortal sin. So um, I, I realized that the Catholics have the answer there. And so even later on when I joined the Catholic Church, it was the Catholic understanding of morality that 
that helped me actually become um, better in some areas that I had struggled with morally as a Protestant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I wouldn't want to imply or that once saved, always saved folk are saying blatantly, it doesn't matter what you do. No, we don't no, say that. So Luther himself, we've got some quotes, yeah, which he seems to say sure. that. Most wouldn't say that. No, they wouldn't say that. But they also, when it comes, push comes to shove on certain issues, uh, they seem to be the groups that over time succumb to the de democratic pressures to start widening that gate of morality. Yeah. And pretty soon here we are today with, yeah. with issues of accepted morality in our culture that 50, 7,500 years ago, would never dreamed yes. we'd be where there are. Yes. And they aren't just atheists that are buying into this stuff. It's Bible-believing Christians. Yes, yes. And, and there comes the trouble again. Where's the authority? Uh, exactly. Who determines whether this is a sin or not? And then who determines whether this is, I mean, a grave sin? How, how do we know? whether contraception is artificial contraception, whether that is a sin, whether divorce and remarriage is a sin. How do we know these things? Um, you have all kinds of views out there. Well, you need an ultimate authority to determine these things. Surely God would not have left us uh, <laughs> orphans without a way of knowing these things, without a way of understanding sacred scripture and sacred tradition authoritatively. So, of course, the answer is found in Catholicism. So, I'm saying that, you know, I, I need to become Catholic. And I had read Lumen Gentium in the Second Vatican Council that was saying that if I refuse to enter the church, anyone who knows that the church was established by Christ who refuses to enter it or remain with it cannot be saved. You have Vatican II explicitly saying that. And I knew what the church fathers had taught on outside the church there is no salvation, which is often misunderstood. You can read about that in the Catechism. I think it's 844. It gives a good explanation of it. But anyways, I knew what the church was saying in that matter. So I realized, look, I can't say that I'm just going to remain a Protestant so that I can be a priest or a pastor. I can't say that when I know that the truth is here with Catholicism. So I gave up my uh, intention of becoming um, a Protestant. Didn't know what I was going to do with myself. I mean, that's what I had invested myself into. I, I wanted to be a pastor. Um, but... I realized it's either that or it's following the truth. Because just to make sure we, we nail this down, what you were discovering is that salvation, with all that you had discovered by grace, isn't merely just you and Jesus. Yeah. You needed to be a part of the body yes. of Christ. Yes, yes, yes. Which, from where you came from, most don't emphasize the necessity of being a part of any particular church, right? They don't, but I, I realize in Scripture, I mean, you have Paul talking about being engrafted into Christ, and, um, and and he does speak about the importance of the church a lot, and so I had to ask the question, which church? <laughs> Is this just some invisible conglomeration of uh, Christians out there? Well, which people are included in that? Do we include the non-Trinitarians? Do we include just the Trinitarians? Do we include these people who believe this on justification or these people who believe that on baptismal regeneration? How do we know who is part of this invisible church? Well, you need some kind of visible way of knowing who's part of the church. Uh, and so when Scripture talks about go to the church and, and uh, how do we know where that church is? Well, I realize that that church is found um, with the bishops that are in communion with the Holy Father. That's how you know you're part of the church. And that's what the earliest church fathers, including the apostolic fathers like St. Ignatius of Antioch, was saying. Like I mentioned to him earlier, he was a disciple of the Apostle John. And here you have St. Ignatius of Antioch at the turn of the second century saying, you must be in communion with the bishop. And then he also says that the bishop of Rome is preeminent. Uh, he doesn't use that exact word, but he, I think he says that he presiding in love. Yeah. Uh, so he sees the Bishop of Rome as preeminent. So you see, even in the earliest church fathers, the necessity of belonging to a bishop who's in communion with the Holy Father. That's how you know that you're in the church. Now at this point, now you're, you're, this is all making sense on paper and up between your ears. 
Have you been to Mass yet? <laughs> I didn't start visiting Mass. The first Mass I, I visited, um, it, it was a beautiful, beautiful Mass, and I fell in love with the liturgy. Uh, and I had also listened to Scott Hahn talking about how the liturgy uh, that takes place here on earth is a reflection of the heavenly liturgy, of what's taking place there constantly. And, and I began to see how the book of Revelation speaks about that with the priest and the incense and uh, with the martyrs under the altar, which is uh, reflected in the relics in the altars in the Catholic Church and the incense and the priests and the vestments and the candles. Uh, I began to see the book of Revelation come into life in the Catholic liturgy. And I fell in love with the fact that here you have heaven uh, coming down to earth, especially in the Eucharist. And so there's a heavenly participation in the Catholic liturgy. I fell in love with that. But I'll tell you what really caught my heart, the Eucharist. <laughs> The Eucharist is really what did it for me. Of course, I knew because of the papacy, I knew I had to be in communion with the Bishop of Rome, but the Eucharist is what I fell in love with. Mm -hmm. You mean to tell me I get to receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the very one who died for me? Are you kidding me? How could you not die for this? How could you not be a part of this? Uh, I was reading John 6 and the early church fathers who were speaking about the real presence of Christ. So I knew that this truly is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus under the appearances of bread and wine. And I fell in love with the fact that I get to actually receive Christ, to be united to Him, the language that Paul uses. Um, so I fell in love with the Eucharist and began to, you know, visit Mass and went through the RCIA programs and I was confirmed uh, Easter Vigil 2012. All right. Yeah. There's a, a wonderful prayer, you know, we've heard this prayer in Scripture where the, the Father asking for our Lord to heal His Son and, and, the, and Jesus asked the Father, do you believe I can do this? And He says, I believe, help my unbelief. Mm -hmm. I've always taken that to also be the dis <clears throat> a description of the journey that many make in a lot of these doctrines. You know, we've, for so long as a Baptist and a Presbyterian, you may have had the Lord's Supper once in a while as a symbol. Once or a year. <laughs> once a year. And uh, so a very large part of your life, that's all it was. And then you discover the, the truth of the Eucharist, but it still takes a while. Yeah. You know, talk about that. Also, maybe with, sure, with Our Lady. Sure. That's you know, what I was right about to you know, get the, to. The it Marian takes a while. Doctrines. Yes, the Marian doctrines. The Eucharist not, wasn't as as hard because I mean it's and don't get me wrong the Marian doctrines are also in the early church fathers but the Eucharist is very evident in what I was reading in the church fathers so that wasn't as hard for me to deal with it was more the Marian doctrines yeah. uh, how do we deal with this for example the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary stuff like that uh, when you don't have it explicit in Scripture it was a little hard for me to accept and you know it's very little mentioned in the church fathers although it is mentioned in them. Um, how do you know that this is a dogma? Well, I know the answer to that now. The Holy Father has declared it definitively, but uh, I, I, I needed a little more. I needed to know that this is really a tradition of the church. Um, but as I reflected on typology, biblical typology, the Marian doctrines came to light. Explain to the audience yes. typology in case you're not familiar. Typology is that understanding of the Old Testament whereby a person, place, or a thing foreshadows something in the New Testament. For example, you have uh, Joseph in the Old Testament who is a type of Christ insofar as he was betrayed by his brothers as Christ was betrayed by the apostles, uh, or most of the apostles. Uh, Joseph is a type of Christ insofar as he was raised to the right hand of Pharaoh, as Jesus is raised to the right hand of God the Father. He's the dispenser. Joseph was the dispenser of bread who fed the people during uh, uh, the famine, as Jesus Christ feeds us his body under the appearances of bread and wine. And so that's typology. You know, the, the people coming out of the land of Egypt through the waters uh, of the Red Sea uh, into the promise land as a type of the church entering through baptism into heaven and into God's grace. That's typology. Yeah. As I began to understand typology, I understood the Marian doctrines, especially Mary being the new Ark of the Covenant. Um, once you understand that, everything falls into place. And what I mean by that is the book of Hebrews tells us that the Ark of the Covenant contained three items. Um, 
some of the manna, the bread that came down from heaven, a jar of the manna, the rod of Aaron, uh, the high priest, his staff that budded, and also the Ten Commandments, the Word of God. So Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant in that she, within her womb, had the living Word of God that came down from heaven as Jesus identifies himself in John 6. You have the living Word of God, John 1. And then you have the true high priest, the ultimate high priest uh, that the book of Hebrews talks about. In, within her womb. So you see that she's a reflection of the Ark of the Covenant. She's a, the antitype, the fulfillment of that. She's the new Ark of the Covenant. Well, how does that relate to the Marian doctrines? Well, the Ark of the Covenant was made of pure gold. Therefore, you can see how she would be uh, free from all stain of sin. It was made of the purest gold, as the Blessed Virgin Mary is pure, free from sin. No one was allowed to touch the Ark of the Covenant, except the Levites, they were allowed to touch it. But the ordinarily, you could not touch the Ark of the Covenant without dying, in the same way that the Blessed Virgin Mary was never known to man, you see. Uh, and of course, the Church Father is saying that she's the new Eve. As Jesus was um, the second Adam, the Adam who undid what Adam did, Mary is the new Eve who untied the knot that uh, Eve did. She, as Mary, or as Eve was without sin before she fell, uh, Mary is without sin. So I, I began to see these things, the typology uh, in the Old Testament of Mary. And, and so once I understood that, the, doc, the Marian doctrines weren't, weren't a problem for me. By the way, the assumption, what do you do with the assumption? There's a psalm that says, uh, Arise, O Lord, and go unto your resting place, you and your ark with you. As Jesus arose and went into heaven, ascended into heaven, he brought his ark with him, the Blessed Virgin, and she was assumed into heaven. So there you have it implicitly in Scripture. And so that just made me feel a lot more comfortable <laughs> <laughs> with the Marian doctrines. Yeah, well, again, it's, it's this, this beautiful uh, sim, uh, connection of faith and reason, you, you know, that behind the Marian dogmas go way back in the theological discernment of bishops for hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of years, trying to understand, you know, the, uh, the incarnation of our Lord mm -hmm. Jesus into the womb mm -hmm. of a woman. Well, what kind of a womb? What kind of a woman? And as a non-Catholic, sadly, many of us treated Mary like she was nothing more than a surrogate mother. Yeah, and I didn't give her much thought. No, but to see that this was very much a part of the love of God, the plan of God. Uh, and, and see, in the early councils, one of them defined her as the Theotokos, the mother of God. Started saying, yeah, these early Christians really placed an emphasis on Mary. Uh, maybe the Protestant understanding is, is deficient. Well, the Catholic emphasis has always been to Jesus through Mary. Yes, yes. Which explains the, the Marian dogmas are all about Jesus, really. Yes, yes. Mary's not our ultimate end. Uh, it it yeah. is God who is our ultimate end, and Mary points us to Christ. All right, let's take an email. Frank from Nevada writes, How should my wife and I respond to our family friend who says that he doesn't need a church or set of doctrines to know what is true? He thinks all is necessary for his faith journey is a Bible, and the Holy Spirit will guide him into knowing what is right and true. Well, again, how, how do you know whose interpretation of the Bible is accurate? Because, I mean, I'm sure this individual has all kinds of views about Scripture, and if uh, another person were to come and challenge it and bring other Scriptures against it, how do you know whose interpretation is correct? And again, Jesus in Matthew 18 says, go and present your case to the church. Which church is he referring to? This has to be a visible church. It can't be an invisible group of Christians, because then you have to ask the question, which group of people belong to this? Do we include the non trinitarian do we include those who agree with the Catholics on justification? Um, so you need yeah. some kind of visible structure and some kind of final magisterium to be able to know uh, whose interpretation of Scripture is, is accurate. So I, I just simply don't see practically how me and my Bible works. Yeah, just, I mean, this sounds like a insensitive way to say it, but just grab the local phone book. Yeah, yeah. And look under church. Yeah. And all those different groups, at least at one time, were Bible-believing folk. Almost all of them, it was a Bible alone. Yeah. And yet, why are they not under the same paragraph? 
under that column in the in the phone book. Yeah. Because they can't agree that the Holy Spirit alone, you know, the Holy Spirit's all mixed mixed up, or there's something wrong with us, or there are yeah. procedure. And, and another thing I think the early church fathers would say to that individual is, it's not sufficient to have just you and your Bible. You have to belong to the church. Uh, St. Cyprian, in around the mid-third century, uh, essentially said, you cannot have God for your father if you don't have uh, the church as your mother. And so, which church do you have to belong to? Uh, and by the way, were the church fathers just completely wrong on that? Where did this doctrine come from? Well, they got it from the apostles. Very good. All right. Another email. Chris from Oklahoma. I am currently in RCA classes, which is fine, but I am looking for a couple of things. A better understanding of Catholic church history mm -hmm. and how to know what it's going on at church and why. Mm -hmm. So I am lost. Yeah, uh, a good understanding of church history. There's a book by, I believe, Father Lau. Um, there's another one by Philip Hughes. Um, there is a really great church history book by James Hitchcock. These yes. are all Catholic authors. So those are available to you. Um, but I would especially recommend read the church fathers themselves, which they are available online for free. Go to newadvent.org. They have a whole bunch of church fathers on there online for free. Read them and you will see that uh, these guys were Catholic. Yeah, again, Early Church Fathers, uh, I'd recommend Dr. Kenneth Howell's translations of the Apostolic Fathers. Uh, also, uh, Mike Aquilina's books mm -hmm. on Early Church Fathers. Yes. Um, Rod Bennett's book, Four Witnesses, is a wonderful book. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Shea, uh, uh, this great, Jimmy Aiken, they've all mm -hmm. have wonderful books on yeah. their Early Church Fathers. And another name I wanted to mention, if you look for church history, almost anything by Alan Shrek, mm -hmm. Dr. Shrek, mm -hmm. his book's on history. He's got a condensed version. He also uh, has a wonderful book on the uh, Vatican II in relationship to mm -hmm. church history. Mm -hmm. Strong book. They're out there. Yeah. I mean, we live at a great time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, with the internet, we have access to a lot of those materials. And so you, you don't even have to have money. Fact, I want you to mention what you're doing on the internet. What am I doing right now? I'm writing a lot. I'm also working on a patristic study Bible believe it or not, uh, where I'm taking a lot of the material that's available in pub public domain and assembling it into a um, study Bible that is going to have church fathers and some medieval writers on every chapter of the Bible, putting it in book format and also putting it online in one organized place for free for people um, so that they can see what the church fathers taught. And, and it focuses a lot on typology too. But also you're doing some studies. Oh, yes. I'm also working on my Master of Arts and Theological Studies at Christendom Graduate College, and it's going wonderful so far. It's a wonderful, wonderful Catholic institution. Very orthodox. Right. Right. Solid and, as and, they come. And my emphasis there is that we live at a great time, that the yes. access to so many good things yes. about our faith is there available. Sometimes I'll get a question from somebody, you know what, you, you Catholics, you know, uh, explain to me purgatory. And I want to say, <laughs> well, just do your homework. Yeah. It's there. Yeah. It's all there to understand what the catechism and yeah. this is all available online. Yeah. Oh, well, you, you have higher uh, edu education available to you with Christendom, very affordable, and it's at your own time that you can do it. It's online. You also have stuff like the Institute of Catholic Culture that has just the best uh, lectures by wonderful bishops, priests, Catholic theologians, uh, and they come and speak at the Institute of Catholic Culture, and they make those, ta yeah. those talks available for free online, and you yeah. can learn about the faith. Of course, I don't want to short shrift EWTN.com. Yes, a absolutely. A lot of good stuff. And, and also Catholic Answers, too. Catholic Answers and CH Resources. You yes. Know, or CH, chnetwork.org, our website. Uh, they're all there to help us yeah. communicate the beauty of our church that, uh, by God's grace, opened our hearts to it. Yes. It wasn't because of your intellect or mine. No. It was the great grace of, yes. of God, and we both appreciate that. One more email, see if we can tuck it in quickly. Tyson sure. from Manchester. Mm -hmm. What do you say to someone who claims that the early church was just made up of people getting together in their homes and there wasn't a eth central authority or structure? That, that's simply not the case. Read St. Ignatius of Antioch, whom I've already mentioned, who um, sat at the feet of the Apostle John, and he says you must be in communion with the bishop. Where did he get this idea? from. 
I mean, did he just completely go off the rails? If so, why don't you have early church uh, writers refuting him? I mean, anytime somebody in the early church came up with a heresy, you had people jumping all over them like Arius. Well, why was Ignatius of Antioch saying that you have to accept the bishop and be in communion with him uh, if this was something that wasn't taught by the apostles? And that is just one example. There's many others. All the apostolic fathers place a great importance on being in communion with the bishop especially the Bishop of Rome. Yeah, it really is an important part. We live in a day and age when everything changes so quickly. Yeah. You know, five years ago, it was so radically different than today. And their day and age, things didn't change yeah. quickly. Yeah. So if an early church father is saying this is the way it is, he's not inventing it. No. He's saying that it's been, had to have been around for 10, yes. 20, 30, 40 Had to. And, years. and these guys were adamant about not coming up with new stuff, about handing on what was deposited in them, what was given to them. They were very uh, adamant about not coming up with something new. Michael, thank you very much. Thank you for having for, me. For joining us in thank the Journey you. Home, sharing your journey. And, and I'll just mention to the audience that we did publish your conversion yes. story in the <laughs> April 2015 yes. copy of the Coming Home Network newsletter. Yes. If someone wants to read more details, your story. So thank you for joining thank us. Thank you for having God me. God bless you in your word. Thank you. And, and thank you for joining on us on this episode of The Journey Home. I pray that Michael's story is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you.